Well, Karen, I know you've had the job that many, many people would like to have had. You must be the envy of thousands of people who would love to have the chance to train dolphins and dogs and all the other animals you've worked with. Um, before we get started on your accomplishments uh, here, I'd like to know a little bit about your background. Could you tell us a little bit about where you grow, grew up, and went to school, and what your hobbies were, and so on? Well, let's see. I was born in New York City. I grew up in Connecticut, Florida, France, California. Um, I was a naturalist from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, many children, many people who end up being naturalists start out as soon yes. as they've seen their first turtle or <laughs> bird or whatever it was. They're, they're fascinated uh -huh. from then on. Um, I mm, went to Cornell. Backing up a little bit, where, where did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Miss Harris's Florida School for Girls. Oh, yes, I've My heard of that. My father was a writer, and he mm -hmm. lived in Florida. Uh -huh. And I went to live with him when I was four, uh, 15, I guess. Uh -huh. went, to that, went to that little school. We spent a lot of time in the Keys and in the Bahamas. He loved to fish, and snorkeling was just coming in. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that I could easily have become a marine biologist. Uh -huh. um, but at Cornell, it was not really possible to major in biology unless you were going pre-med. Oh, yeah. So I majored in English and took all the biology courses mm -hmm. I wanted to. Uh, yeah. So I came out of Cornell with a good background in natural history, but that wasn't considered a, a field then. Exactly. Yes, I see. Uh -huh. So um, uh, before you got into your um, present uh, career, uh, what um, were you in some other line of work when you graduated from Cornell? Well, I got married and had three children. Um, That's and sort of I a went to grad <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of work. Uh -huh. I went to graduate school at the University of Hawaii. I went. I uh, uh, did my master's level work in marine bi in marine zoology. Yes. Uh -huh. um, there again, I didn't aim for. I didn't aim for a degree. As a mother, I didn't really have time mm -hmm. to waste on anything but the courses I really wanted. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that during that period, I also wrote a book called Nursing Your Baby on breastfeeding for mothers, oh, mm -hmm. um, I had the use of the medical library and the university library, and I researched that at the same time that mm -hmm. I was going to graduate school. The two things fit together mm -hmm. very well. And then uh, my first husband, Tap Pryor, started Sea Life Park, and a few months before it was due to open, three months before it was due to open, they discovered that they had caught all these dolphins, and they had hired trainers, and Ken Norris was the advisor for mm -hmm. these trainers, but the dolphins had trained the trainers to give them fish for nothing. <laughs> An interesting problem, yes. And yes, we had a manual um, that had been written by one of Skinner's graduate students, a fellow named Ron Turner, whom I yes. had lost touch with shortly after mm -hmm. those years, um, on, how on, on shaping and mm -hmm. reinforcement and how to train a dolphin. He had done some, he had trained Ken's research dolphins. Mm -hmm. um, Ken was, had just, had previously been a curator at Marine Land, and he had been studying sonar, and he wanted somebody to teach his animal to echolocate. And he, that's how he discovered Turner. So he had this manual that Turner had put together. Um, but the trainers weren't able to follow it. It was pretty dense. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the only person in the premises who had ever trained anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and all I had trained, well, I had an obedience dog. I had a Weimaraner mm -hmm. that we'd done uh, wonderfully well with a real competition <laughs> obedience dog. He loved the work, and we'd had a lot of fun. I'd had a lot of fun, and the dog had, too. And I trained a pony. And so I sat down with Ron Turner's, this manuscript, and stayed up all night reading it. They asked me, <laughs> since Ken, Ken suggested me, take over the training. I thought it would be a terrible idea to go to work full time when I still had three little children. They, two weren't even in school yet. Um, and I didn't know how it was going to work out working for my husband. <laughs> I wasn't sure. And I was right. That was a terrible idea. But I sat there and, and read this manuscript and I was fascinated. Um, because everything that I had done with the dog and the pony suddenly became clear to me. I could see why where I had built in errors into the behaviors. Um, and I couldn't wait to try this stuff. <laughs> and the dolphins were perfect animals to try mm -hmm. it on.
because they were big and greedy. And uh, you could get a lot of re reinforcements in, so you had plenty of room for error. They were very active. You know, I really wasn't interested in them. Per personally, I wasn't sentimental about them the way people are. Uh, I was more interested in the coral reef exhibits. That had been my main interest um, at the university, at mm -hmm. coral reef ecology. Well, when did you begin this work with the dolphins? Uh, October 1st, 1963. Mm -hmm. And we opened the park three months later. And when we opened the park, we had two completely trained shows, three species of dolphins, one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven individuals, two completely different shows in different arenas, and I don't know, 20 behaviors. Okay. Um, it was really a blitz. Exciting. Yeah, yes, it was. It was a yeah. very exciting <laughs> period. Uh, well, who were, would you say were the people that influenced you most during these, this time when you were developing this show? That was a solo job. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote mm -hmm. the show. I, nobody had given any thought to the, uh -huh. to the theater aspects yeah. of it. And, uh, and I had minored in theater at Cornell. Mm -hmm. So I knew something about playwriting. Yeah. I knew something yeah. about shows <laughs> have to have a beginning, a middle, and end. They have to be exciting. You have to mm -hmm. use your whole stage. You know, not just mm -hmm. some little animal doing a little trick in the corner. Wait, so, did you have occasion to study behavioral psychology either in your undergraduate days or at, uh, at uh, Cornell, I mean, in, in your master's work at Hawaii? No. Mm -hmm. So you had Never. not heard of B.F. Skinner prior I to hadn't that. heard of B.F. Skinner till that manual fell in my hand. Now, yeah. I did have an idol, and that idol was Conrad Lorenz. Yes. I had uh, uh, been sent, Robert Lindner, the psychiatrist, was a friend of my uh -huh. father's, and he sent me a copy of... Um, King Solomon's Ring in college because I had the habit when I went to his house for dinner of talking directly to the dog. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, the dog was a poodle whom most of the family mm. detested and Lindner thought this was very peculiar of me but of course the dog liked it a good mm, deal. Surely, yeah. And uh, so he sent me this book about talking to animals <laughs> as a joke. However, <laughs> I, I was more moved by that. That was a tremendous turning point for mm -hmm. me because here was, I'd been looking at animals all my life. The professors at Cornell in ornithology, for example, which I took all they would let me take, um, were very strict non-ethologists. Mm -hmm. This was then a new field, a new way of looking at behavior, and they hated it. They were mechanists, mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah. Um, and, so, and I knew they were wrong. I knew there was more to it. There was more going on than that. And Lorenz, of course, had opened up Pandora's box. There were all the feelings the animals had, the reasons why they have fe the feelings and how they express them. So that was, that was my natural bent, too. Um, the, uh, the little manual on operant conditioning that this, the Skinner student had written was also, it was a thunderbolt. I think I wouldn't have appreciated it so much if I hadn't had that obedience champion. And if I hadn't had a pony foal that turned up to, grew up to be a rather aggressive young stallion and needed, so I had gone the traditional mm -hmm. route. I had trained the traditional training in two different species. I at least had a point of reference for the Skinner stuff. Well, you know, how, I, how uh, would you contrast the traditional animal training with the uh, Skinnerian methods? Oh, well, I mean, I've been thinking about that for 30 years, right? Okay. Now I am beginning <laughs> to be able to tell them what the difference is. The primary difference is they don't understand secondary reinforcers. They don't use them. Um, so they have to rely instead on repetition and drilling, uh, which is a very slow way to teach anything. Um, the more fundamental difference is really that the traditional or cons uh, the conventional training is taught by apprenticeship usually uh, without analysis uh, sometimes the really extremely good trainers will have a very good grasp of why they are doing what they're doing but the uh, most trainers don't they just do this is what you do this is how you train a cow pony this is how you train a um, bear to roller skate they have learned one met they, they train by method they, they mm -hmm. it's rule governed behavior as the psychologists <laughs> okay. like to say yes. instead of uh, training by principles mm -hmm. um, so they're stuck when they're faced with a new species for example if they don't have a set of methods they can't do yeah. anything with them um, and al also they're, they're very defensive about their methods and often secretive 
since they don't know what they're doing, <laughs> they don't know what, which of the things they're doing work, they have to kind of hang on to all of it. Uh, what, did, what did you, when you started training the dolphins and working with the other people at Sea Life Park, what did you call the methods you used at that time? Operant conditioning. Operant conditioning, yes. Um, have you had, aside from the book of Conrad Lorenz you mentioned, were there any other books or articles that you read at that time? Oh, and Ron Turner's uh, that manual. little training manual. Were there any other articles or books on the subject that you read? No, I, 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 at the end of the first year or so, I wrote my own manual mm -hmm. uh, so that my trainers would have something, uh, they could something that they could mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. Ron's manual had a lot of math in it. Oh, For dear. example, mm -hmm. there was two pages of math about how to figure out an average variable ratios going, come on, <laughs> you know, you don't need anything no. <laughs> uh, in the way of numbers to right. randomize your reinforcements a little. When you started out, what would you say was the main purpose of your work? What were you trying to accomplish? Oh, I was trying to get those shows on the road, up and running. Mm -hmm. Very soon after that, Ken uh, Norris came out and started doing research training. Uh, started doing research with the dolphins, and mm -hmm. so we began doing um, some since we didn't have anybody to teach us, everything we did was innovative, was innovation. We had to invent what we were doing, and since we had operant conditioning to work with, and, and you, could, you could easily see what, mm -hmm. how, how to use it, um, we innovated a lot of research training, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, uh, you mentioned a number of animals. Could you name some of the species you worked with, besides your dog and your pony? And uh, the uh, dolphins, I know there were several species of dolphins you mentioned. Bottlenose dolphins, but I, I only worked with um, the Terciops gilli, the Atlanta, uh, Pacific, Pacific bottlenose. Mm -hmm. um, spinners, that's uh, Stenella longirostris. Uh, spotters, that's Stenella tenuata. We had Pseudorca crassidens. We had pilot whales. We had Steno bredenensis, which is by far the most interesting to me of the small dolphins, and I think that's because it's a large prey predator. Oh. It has developed a lot of, uh, they're very intelligent, what can I tell you? A lot of strategies involving being able to learn, being able to change behavior, being able to think, uh, I think because of that. I, I was always very interested in the ethology of these animals, and I've mm -hmm. continued to be, in fact, I think you ask my own interest, my own goal has always been to bring these two camps together. Mm -hmm. To me, it, the, you can't understand animal behavior as an ethologist unless you understand how they learn <coughs> and when they are learning and when they are acting by rote, as it were, hardwired. <coughs> and I don't think you can really understand learned behavior unless you understand what came with the package first and just how important that is and when it crops up and when it doesn't. Um, so those two areas and they conjoin beautifully in multiple species of dolphins just as they do in multiple species of uh, varieties of dogs. We've, uh, that's where I, what I like to look at and that's what I was enjoying looking at in 65, 66, 67. That's my work is all, even the book on breastfeeding mm -hmm. goes right down the middle between those two fields. Some of this behavior is innate, some of this is learned. If you mess up one side or the other you can't execute this particular human behavior. That's very interesting, yes. Uh, when was that book published, by the way, uh, the book on breastfeeding? 63. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what animal behavior accomplishment are you most proud of? Of me? Mm -hmm. Well, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> or let's I'll say... I'll tell you, uh, the one I think is the most fun was stumbling into the uh, fishing dolphins of Laguna in Brazil. Really? Uh -huh. um, there was a case where you had a beautiful piece of very elaborate learned behavior, learned on the part of a whole tribe of dolphins, learned on a part of a whole tribe of humans, which had not tribe. These are ordinary citizens in a town. <laughs> People. Okay. Uh, well, I guess you could speak to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not yeah, a primitive situation. Yeah, they have. Right. There's a little man on the yeah, beach sells right. sandwiches. This it's a is community. civilized uh, yes, community. Okay. <laughs> but they have been fishing cooperatively with the dolphins all day, every day, for a hundred years. And their fathers oh and grandfathers before them, and the dolphins' grandmothers <laughs> and great grandmothers <laughs> before them. And uh -huh. uh, the Brazilians knew it existed, um, but they thought everybody had one. 
you know, like snake charmers. It was <laughs> yes. just sort of a local curiosity. Uh -huh. The American scientists who went through, none of them were trainers. And I think it took a trainer, it took an eye look for both the ethology of the situation and the, yes, and uh, the uh, uh, operant, the reinforcement contingencies to see what was going on. Well, now, did and these dolphins bring fish to the fishermen? Is that the way it the works? The fishermen line up on the beach with their throw nets, <coughs> spaced a net's length apart, width apart. The dolphins wait in the channel until they hear the mullet coming in, and I think it's passive. It's very muddy. The water's mm -hmm. very muddy. The fishermen can't see them. Mullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the one dolphin at a time, the dolphin will bring a fish, surround the fish, and chase them at the fishermen. And when they get to the fishermen, dive in such a way as to tell Splash the fishermen to throw their nets. Uh. So the fishermen must have the dolphin's cue, or they won't know when to throw, or they won't know who to throw. <laughs> There's 40 guys there, you know. There's only six of them going to catch mullet each time. The dolphin gets the benefit of um, the school being scattered and confused by the net, so the dolphin can easily catch the perimeter. So he, he earns his own reinforcement, but he also cues the fishermen. For it's from the dolphin standpoint, he has trained these fishermen to stop the mullet in their tracks. <laughs> okay. uh, and taught, and actually females and males a lot. It goes from, it goes apparently from mother to, anyway, I thought it was a great, and it was, I, yeah, I thought maybe. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Um, Aside from the uh, uh, show behaviors that you worked with and so on, have you worked in any other areas of animal training? Oh, well, we go back to species, you know. Um, I, d I did a lot of little fooling around with hermit crabs and fish and birds galore. Um, I have a few horse trainers around here now that, that are using operant conditioning instead of, and positive reinforcement, uh -huh. and stimulus control, vocal words and so on instead of leash and bridle and whips and mm -hmm. and spurs and so forth and so right now I've got I'm playing with people's mm -hmm. horses through the people themselves so sure. to speak um, primates I don't work with primates I'm the terrifying uh -huh. um, and also because if my new my don't, don't shoot the dog um, mm. Intermittently, I work with parents, mm -hmm. not on not on a one-to-one -one basis, but uh, but I do a certain amount of lecturing yeah. to parents mm -hmm. groups. So um, you feel the data and methods from this animal research apply to human problems? Well, the process is the same, as you well know. All right. Mm -hmm. Probably better than anybody on the planet. It doesn't <laughs> matter what species you're dealing with. If you've got something that they can, that they want, and you've got something that they can perceive to use as a condition reinforcer and so as condition stimuli, the process is the same. It doesn't matter if it's a goldfish or an Episcopalian bishop. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you have a, encounter any problems or questions that called for really novel solutions? All the really, time. All the time. Well, don't you think this kind of interactive training? One of the things about what we do with with animals, uh, we marine mammal trainers, whatever animal we actually happen to be training, is that it's an, it's an equal loop. You're, it's not something you're doing to the animal. It's something you and the animal are doing together. And this means the animal can initiate the engagement. Uh, and that means you've constantly, you're constantly dealing with new problems. Mm -hmm. Wolves, for example, um, Eric Klinghammer asked me to come out to Purdue once and uh, um, help his graduate students and, and his staff learn to find ways to move the wolves around without actually physically touching them without the capture gun. Well, you know this is, this is a very easy problem. <laughs> right. And once you have taught the wolf to shift on command and with kibble and so on. But the wolves are marvelously inventive in their funny way, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they train the people just as fast <laughs> as the people train them. So I'll probably think up some more animals. I did teach mm. a course at, um, for six months on a bi-weekly basis at the National Zoo. This would have been in the early, very early 80s, about 1980, mm. um, with a broad range of keepers from all over the zoo. 
teaching them operant conditioning mm -hmm. so they could use it for shift animals and so mm -hmm. forth. And that perhaps was the most delightful experience of uh, working with novel species. Yes. The animal to me, although nobody in my class ever used the animal, I found myself playing with it whenever I could get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that fascinating mind was the wildebeest. Really? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting animal. Outwit you at every turn, you know? Constantly oh, really? one jump ahead of you. <laughs> Amazing. One doesn't expect that. No, <laughs> you should be sort of a slowed down cow, but not mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Probably cows are smarter than we think, too, but go on. That's possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, the, in, your, in your work settings, uh, have you dealt mostly with individual animals? I know you've mentioned uh, some work you've done with groups, mm -hmm. but uh, has it been, would you say, mostly with individuals? Or? No, I don't think it's been mostly individuals. It uh -huh. goes either way. Either way. It just uh -huh. is a, a slightly different set of procedures, mm -hmm. and you're working with half a dozen. When I'm teaching dog trainers in seminars, I'll very often get six people up there and shape a behavior simultaneously in all of mm -hmm. them so that they realize it's possible. <laughs> uh, when you're dealing with the uh, groups of uh, animals, do you find the need of in, any new principles that enter into the situation? Do you know, I keep looking for new principles. I keep looking for the need for new principles. <laughs> it seems impossible or unlikely that everything that we started with at Sea Life Park, that that encompassed the whole of what you basically need to know to put operant conditioning to work, but I haven't come up with anything that's mm -hmm. missing yet, have you? No, I haven't. And it I've was all right there. I mean, Skinner said it all. Mm -hmm. I think that the emphasis, the, the value, I'd love to know what you have to think, of, think about this too, but I, I think the value of the secondary reinforcer was not totally recognized in the 40s and 50s, in Skinner's mm -hmm. literature, and, and it wasn't recognized, it wasn't uh, identified for me as being as powerful. Mm -hmm. That's the cue. Mm -hmm. That's the clue. You've got to have that chirp, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. secondary reinforce that. Uh, not until Ogden Lindsley at ABBA last year pointed out that that's the event marker. Did I really, I, I, did I really, I mean, I understand it, I use it, but that cleared up something mm -hmm. for me that had, hadn't been, mm -hmm. that's why it's so powerful. Right. Uh, I hadn't quite, that hadn't been quite verbalized before mm -hmm. for me, but. Uh, it's important, yeah. Well, of course, uh, you've encountered the problems with species differences, and yet this is not really a failure of the operant conditioning principles, oh, no. per se. It, it, the, you have to recognize, as you said, that animals have different behaviors built into them and that you have to deal with they, these. And, they come with mm -hmm. feelings and skills or abilities in different spoons full. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Cats, for example, uh, learn very easily by observation. So if you want all your cats to sit on the dining room table in a row, all you have to do is get mm -hmm. shape one of them, and the others will try whatever's working for cat A, cat B will certainly try. Uh, dogs will never do that. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean smart or dumb, and it has nothing to do with operant conditioning. It's just a capacity of the animal, like that dog's ability to walk on her hind legs. Some right. other dogs mm -hmm. can't do that. She can. So, yeah. Have you, um, in your capacity as a training and a director of tra trainer and a director of training, uh, observed any drift in your programs that you've set in uh, place, say you've trained trainers to f do some things, uh, when you, what happens when you go off and leave them with this? <laughs> well, I, I, there is some drift. Um, the same trainers that I trained in the 60s are still there at Sea Life Park, some of them, and this is um, 30 years now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, almost. And. Uh, they can still train any behavior they set out to train, but the transmittal of the operant information has dwindled to the subsequent mm. trainers oh, beneath them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have seen oceanariums where um, it's been lost. Mm -hmm. I've seen one place in Florida where the tradition of reinforcing behavior with a bridging stimulus and so forth it has actually vanished. And they have gone back helplessly to traditional techniques such as starvation, mm. physical force, 
you know, just what the cavemen had, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, <laughs> so without, uh, I think it's difficult to maintain a, a uh -huh. ideas that are not yet quite in the zeitgeist of the culture. Right. Uh, they're getting there. Yes. It's, it's a lot easier to explain to an audience now than it was 20 years ago or even 10. Yes. A lot easier. They are. They're sort of. They already sort of know about it. Mm -hmm. um, well, have you run into any ethical questions or objections about training animals? About oh, sure. Uh, only in that you get animal protectionists. I have never personally had to deal with this. Mm -hmm. But people who work in zoos and aquariums tell me now that they are constantly dealing with animal protectionists who want them to think of training as cruel. Mm -hmm. That's because they don't understand what we do. They only understand, they, on, they remember or, or consider that all training must be starvation and deprivation and mm -hmm. control and so forth, the old ways. Um, w if you can bring them around to understand, this is quite different. Uh, um, that presumed, it's just, it's ignorance. Mm -hmm. It's ignorance. When you've gone into new settings, such as your work with the National Zoo and other places, have you run into any administrative uh, um, resistance <laughs> <laughs> about oh using these? Oh, boy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> About using these ideas, uh, well, conservative organizations are always horrified by any new idea. And it takes a lot to break that down. And zoos are And zoos are very conservative for yes. many good reasons. There are their business is conserving. <laughs> I guess you might put. Besides that, besides mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, if you have a <coughs> rare and delicate animal and you change something in its habitat, it may be for the worse. Mm -hmm. You can't, uh, you know, and it's uh, doing all right now for don't change anything, you know. <laughs> right. uh, I can sympathize with that. What uh, groups of people would you most like to influence? Governments. governments. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it would be nice yes. if, if governments thought about the con reinforcement contingencies? It certainly would. Involving <laughs> what they do, yes, of course. Yeah. And then parents mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. I think the whole point of this is that it's a... Well, my motive is to reduce the gratuitous cruelty in the world. Mm -hmm. Animals are, are just a sample of what right. you can do with them. Uh, if um, a student or a young person comes to you and asks for advice about how to get into a career of this sort, uh, what uh, advice would you give them? How would you ask them to suggest they prepare for such a career? Now that I know some behavior analysts, there are some places where behavioral work of very fine work with people and is being uh, taught. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's it's hard to say. They're really, you know, this is a new. It's not that behavior analysis is new. It's, we've, that's been around for, you know, for, for a generation now. But the, um, the richness of, the, of applying it, the richness and of, it's like, it's as if the guys in the laboratories know all about paint and canvas and brushes, how to make them, how they stick, what colors mixed make what color, but they don't paint pictures. The people who paint pictures need to know all that, too. The people who paint pictures are just beginning to be the people who teach. Can you think of any new ways of using behavior analysis? You mean operant conditioning? Yes, operant conditioning, uh, right. I, the so analysis is <laughs> what you do in, on paper. Uh, well yeah. Many people are using the behavior analysis as a... As a substitute term for operant conditioning. I know, and it bothers me as a writer. Mm -hmm. Analysis is analysis. Doing is doing. <laughs> You're right. uh, okay, well, any new so ways of using of, operant of, conditioning? Of using these powerful tools. Right, okay. Yeah, well, I think that, I think it should be part of everybody's human toolbox. We should all be aware of, so you don't gratuitously reinforce what you're trying to get rid of in yourself mm -hmm. or other people. I mean, just for a start. Uh, do you uh, use behavior uh, principles, uh, operant conditioning, in your everyday life? You bet. Okay. With your family and friends? And I the... thank people for doing things. I, I call up and thank my agent when she sells something for me. Uh, 
Yeah, once in a while I've sent flowers to a publisher because they <laughs> made a paperback deal or something. I, nobody does this. I know. Why does nobody do this? They always call up in sentimental tears. <laughs> An author said thank you. I can't believe it. <laughs> yes, I do it. I know everybody should. And a lot of it is just good manners, too. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> I guess in many <coughs> ways you can look at opera and conditioning as good manners in, in many situations. Right? Yes, except that it... <clears throat> the, the element of timing that's so crucial. Mm, yeah, the, the contingencies. The there. contingencies that are so mm -hmm. crucial. That is counterintuitive. Yeah. That you have to yeah. think about and think about and cram into people's mm -hmm. heads and think about and show them over and over because that doesn't come naturally. Oh, is there anything you might do differently given the chance to repeat any of your past experiences, knowing what you know now? Oh, I, <laughs> that's sort of, you know, Edith Piaf, je ne regret rien. <laughs> I don't think I would go to school any more than I did. I'm very mm -hmm. happy with it. I, I went back in uh, the late 70s. I was in New York, and I went back into graduate school part-time and picked up uh, the new work in evolutionary biology and a little um, cell biology and things. A lot mm -hmm. had happened, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of brought me up to speed. Um, in, as an ethologist, it's hard to find school to teach something that's hap that isn't <laughs> that's just developing. That's front that's right. edge. So, yeah. uh, no. did you ever get your master's degree? Nope. No, nor a PhD. Uh -huh. mm -mm. Uh, well, where do you think the field is going? The field of operant conditioning. What do you think the future will be? Don't shoot the dog was the book I wrote in. Uh, it came out in '85, oh. uh, which in which I tried to lay out all of the rules of operant conditioning in a, in a way that was sufficiently readable so that normal people could understand them and use them. And gradually, that's working. The dog training, the book is not about dog training. That's the title mm -hmm. the publishers put on it. Um, but g dog trainers are buying it, and, s and I'm talking to them in these days. At the moment, that happens to be just where I'm working. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> <coughs> because that's a huge population of people who are crazy about training, very excited and anxious to learn. So they're nice dolphins. Mm -hmm. You know, they really yeah, want sure. this stuff. Right. I've got fish galore <laughs> here for them. <laughs> and what I hear them saying is that just, you know, they too are applying this in their daily life. Um, Stop yelling at the kids because you get to notice that yelling doesn't work. What does work? Take a look. You know, there. I hear them com coming back to me not just about, yeah, I did this and my dog is now winning for me, um, but about the looking at the contingencies and the and the principles on the job, mm -hmm. um, at home. So on an individual basis, I think that is where it's going. On a corporate basis. Um, a lot of companies are set up with um, out regard for the ethology of the company um, and without regard for the reinforcement contingencies. I think that is where we're going to see uh, operant conditioning making a difference too, and of course eventually in politics, in government anyway. You mentioned uh, Don't Shoot the Dog. Uh, I know you've written other articles and books. Uh, what are some of the others that you have, say, some that you are most proud of? Again, that's the wrong question. All yes, right. proud oh, of. Why don't you write your own, <laughs> own <laughs> No, no, no. It's just not, you know, it's just not exactly the way I think of them. Oh, okay. uh, I can, one of the areas that I keep circling around and coming back to is operant conditioning as communication, as a way of unpacking the animal's mind and talking directly into, or the person. But, um, for me, it, that's my subject is animals and not autistic children or something. Mm -hmm. So it's such a wonderful way of getting in, getting things across to them. So I'm interested in them. I've written several papers uh, on communication and reinforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm working on another one right now. Last summer's President's Scholar's Address at the yeah. Behavior Analysis Conference um, was addressed to that issue. Um, Maybe my very favorite is, is the most flashiest and most elaborate and complete example of mm -hmm. operant conditioning that I've ever seen in real life. 
aside from marine mammal training and elephants, what they're doing now with uh -huh. elephants is very rich too. Mm -hmm. But the richest use of all of the principles involved is the good uh, symphony conductors in rehearsal. <laughs> Really? And I wrote a paper about that in Psychology Today years ago oh. that I had a lot of fun doing. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, yes, I was a singer, and and uh, uh -huh. uh, so as a as a member of the vast chorus, I had a chance to look very often at guest conductors and at uh -huh. the conductor of the orchestra that I was usually singing with, and so forth. And rehearsal techniques of the great ones involved beautiful, beautiful reinforcement. Perfect, positive and negative. Boy, mm -hmm. timing, you know, right on the dot. Um, and if you ask them afterwards, and I did, I asked several um, in over a couple of years interviewing them, you know, w if they understood what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, yeah. I noticed, you know, you corrected the oboist, and you did it just then, this is what I saw, and they'll say, Yes, of course, and let me tell you about the bassoonist. And they know, they know, <laughs> they know what, what they're, they're doing. doing. Yeah, uh -huh. they do. That, that is interesting. So that's maybe right. a favorite. <laughs> uh, most people don't seem to have a very clear <coughs> idea of what science is all about. Uh, what is your general definition of science? Oh, it's the truth. The truth. Science is about the truth, as mm -hmm. far as we know. What about technology? How does that differ from science? Well, technology is about uh, working, making things work, based on scientific principles. Operant conditioning is a technology. Right. Mm -hmm. A beautiful technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, of course. Based on the science of animal based, behavior. Yeah, based on the science of behavior analysis. Right. Because animal behavior encompasses ethology. That's another kind of animal behavior. There are two totally different bunches of people calling mm -hmm. themselves yes, yeah. animal behaviorists. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what's been the impact of science on your own life? Well, it's the heart of my work, mm -hmm. along with art. What about the impact of science on the world as a whole? What did you say has been the, that impact? Well, I think that's wonderful. I, I mean, I'm a scientist. What am I going <laughs> to Of course, I think it's marvelous. I'm not against mm -hmm. it at all. Okay. I, think it is, I think it's naive to blame anything that's wrong uh, with our society on science. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Well, what do you think the average person in the street's concept of science would be? I don't know, but you know, even a lot of scientists, especially the so-called hard scientists, have a very poor understanding of biology and behavior. That is sort of ignored by the non-behavioral scientists. Beha we are a behavior-blind society. That's one of the things that is wrong with us. We don't have enough science. We need mm -hmm. a little more. Um, that, and that sort of leads to, I, I just read a long article here about what scientists think of God in Newsweek or something. Mm -hmm. Well, they were all astronomers. No, They're really. asking the wrong people, you know? <laughs> yes, <that's laughs> and true. those guys don't think very, uh, very clearly about, uh, about us life forms. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, well, what do you think we can do to improve the concept of science in the world at large? Well, I think we need to get busy and revamp the educational system so it reinforces what people ought to be doing, which <laughs> is learning how to think mm -hmm. okay. and how to learn. And operant conditioning is one way to do that. Right. Well, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for your time and your insights and all your experience and so on. Thank, Thank you, Mary. I had, I had my dissertation all done at uh, uh, Rutgers in New York. Really? Huh? I've done the research on, um, well, remember the controversy about tuna, and about porpoises, dolphins being caught in tuna fishermen's yes. nets? Mm -hmm. Well, I had been working on that problem as an advisor to the tuna industry. And then uh, National Marine Fisheries Service sent me out to see as principal investigator to look at the behavior of the dolphins. Mm -hmm. um, and they w the dolphins were spotted dolphins, Stenella attenuata. Ingrid and I went together oh, yeah. um, and did a study which was finally published a couple of years ago in which we uh, dove on the, in the nets every time they set the net and went out amongst the animals and uh, uh, 
got as much inf data as we could mm -hmm. while the animals were still in net. <coughs> I was very interested in the social structure. This was, for me, pure ethology. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how those huge conglomerations of a thousand animals, they had to be very finely structured because I know those animals and they're snobs. They do not go around with strangers. Mm -hmm. So within that aggregation, there had to be all kinds of little fine-grained so, structures, mm -hmm. and there were, and there mm -hmm. were subgroups and s groups of subgroups and tribes of groups of subgroups, you know, mm -hmm. just visible yeah. as if they had. So that was fascinating, and that constituted my thesis at Rutgers. Oh, yes. Where, um, so I came into Rutgers in the graduate program in the zoology department with, as it were, a thesis done, mm -hmm. the research done, yeah. most of the writing done, um, and just coursework to pick up. So it was backwards yes, right. from most people. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, and I picked up the coursework. The one thing I could not do was, the one requirement I couldn't meet was a full year on campus. Oh, gee. Full yeah, year, full time. Bad. I couldn't afford it. Yeah, I was certainly. earning a living. I had two kids in college, mm -hmm. my, an elderly mother. And then uh, John and I decided to get married, and I couldn't make him <laughs> uh, live in Newark for a year. Yeah. You know.